Uh, hi everyone, thank you for attending today. Uh, today we're going to talk about neural development of symbolic math knowledge from childhood to young adulthood. The symposium has been organized by Yumji Park. She is a PhD student at UW-Madison and she has a quick introduction um, about the presenters. Um, so I wanted to ask everyone to mute their microphones and uh, if you have questions, Yumji will be moderating the questions later. But if you could type the questions, uh, and then you're going to have the chance to speak it out aloud to everyone. So uh, I'll let you just start. And yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to our symposium, Neural Development of Symbolic Math Knowledge from Childhood Young Adulthood. Uh, and many thanks to MCLS for organizing this great series of symposium. I'm so excited about our symposium um, covering whole number learning to uh, fractions and functional brain to structural brain and uh, also different uh, with different young age ranges. I just wanted to briefly uh, introduce our speakers and um, overview of our symposium. So as a first speaker, uh, Alisa will present the data showing how symbolic math concept is actually counting. Uh, emerging the brains of preschool children. And next, Stephanie will talk about whole num um, talk about the neural substrates uh, engaged for mapping uh, between number words and visual, uh, visual quantity. And beyond the whole numbers, our last two talk, we'll talk about a fraction. And as a third presenter, um, uh, John will talk about uh, how non-symbolic and symbolic fractions are presented in the adolescence brain and compare with other age ranges too. And at last, I will talk about, um, I will present a study looked at the structural brain and how it relates to um, symbolic and non-symbolic fractions in primary school children. Uh, I'm done here. Uh, Alisa, feel free to share your screen. All right, how does that look? Oh, looks great. Okay, great. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for being here today. I'm excited to get things started. Um, the original plan for this talk was to talk about um, one project about preschool children and then another in school-age children. Um, but due to the time limitations and mostly due to COVID impeding data collection, I'm just going to focus on preschool children. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about a project that looks at um, the emergence of counting in the brains of three to five year old children. This is some work that I did in grad school with Jessica Cantlin. So one of the reasons we're interested, one of the reasons we're interested in the acquisition of counting is because this is one of the earliest uniquely human math concepts that children learn and it lays the foundation for more complex math concepts. And so broadly, we're interested in understanding what it is about the human brain that allows us to learn to represent exact quantities using symbols. So one idea that's been put forth a few times in the literature is that because of structural constraints in the brain that are imposed by evolution, the acquisition of culturally derived concepts such as math probably build on um, similar perceptual functions in the human brain that have an evolutionarily primitive origin. So the idea is that the neural circuitry that underlies those primitive perceptual abilities is repurposed or recycled for culturally acquired conceptual systems. And this is similar to the idea that cognition is grounded in perception and the idea that high level cognition builds from simpler core concepts. And so the prediction with regards to mathematics is that formal mathematics builds on um, numerosity representations in the intraparietal sulcus or um, as you'll see it abbreviated the IPS. And there are at least two good reasons that we um, suspect the acquisition of counting could rely on these primitive numerosity representations in the IPS. The first is that we see the same neural signature of non-symbolic numerosity representations across species and across um, development. And so this, this suggests that um, across species and um, throughout development, we're using the same mechanism to represent numerosities. And specifically that um, signature is this idea of neural tuning. So what's going on is we have neurons in the brain that are responding the most to preferred numerosities and then respond less as the quantity in question becomes more different from the preferred quantity. And you can clearly see this in the figure on the left, um, which is showing data from single cell recordings in macaques. 
Now in humans, it's um, not easy to get uh, data from individual neurons, but we can use fMRI um, and these fMRI adaptation paradigms to test for a similar signature. And so the data that I'm showing you here from humans um, show raw data and then um, fits from a mathematical model that was derived from the monkey data. Um, and we see that that mathematical model explains the fMRI adaptation both in adults and in really young children. Now we can go one step further um, to compare the tuning curves across species. And we do this by plotting the um, inverted normalized response from the monkey curves against ratio. And we apply that same mathematical model. And when we see is the sensitivity as calculated by this model, which is indicated by the letter W, is the same in young children as it is in number naive macaques. So this suggests that children who haven't started school yet um, and monkeys who have no formal number training are representing numerosities in a similar manner. And so this provides um, support for this type of numerosity representation as having an evolutionarily primitive origin. The second piece of evidence suggesting that these representations may support the acquisition of counting is that we see overlap between neural representations of numerosities and number words in proficient counters. Um, so what I'm showing you here is the left and the right intraparietal sulci in adults and eight-year-old children who have already begun their formal math education. And so um, the question that we're interested in answering is, um, are these numerosity representations important, important for learning to count and learning what the number words mean? So the main predictions that we're testing here are that if these numerosity representations in the IPS support the acquisition of counting, we should see that the IPS represents the count words before they're acquired, and we should see um, overlap between representations of numerosity and counting in the IPS in novice counters. Now, another possibility that's been raised in the literature is that number words are acquired in another region of, of the brain and then shift to the IPS after their acquisition. So for example, it could be that there are other regions of the numerosity network that support the acquisition of counting, um, such as the IFG, or we might see other networks entirely, such as the um, language network, which is unique to humans. Um, and here I'm highlighting the lexical semantic network, which has been implicated in novel word learning, um, and what are number words to young children, if not novel words. So to test these predictions, we brought three to five-year-old children who were learning to count into the lab, and we had them do two tasks during fMRI scanning. First, to identify neural representations of counting, we had them um, do this natural counting task where they heard someone saying um, either sequences from the count list or sequences of the alphabet. And we used the alphabet sequences as a control for processing sequence of culturally acquired symbols. Um, we had to present the stimuli auditorily because children can't read at this point. Um, but you can imagine that listening to somebody counting or saying the alphabet for 20 minutes would be quite boring. So to try to keep the kids engaged, we showed um, cartoon clips on the screen and we removed the original audio tracks and replaced them with instrumental music and then layered these sequences on top. Um, and this paradigm allowed us to collect data from 43 children evenly distributed in age between three and five. Um, so then using this paradigm, we were able to test whether regions of the brain were sensitive to ornality, in which case we should see overlap between counting and alphabet sequences, or whether regions were sensitive to the semantic meanings of the list items, in which case we should see that different items represent um, the counting and alphabet sequences. And what we found was a dissociation in the IPS between counting and alphabet sequences, um, such that the IPS only represented counting sequences, um, but we saw overlap in the left inferior frontal gyrus and the anterior tem temporal lobe or ATL. Now, our first prediction was that if the IPS is important for the acquisition of counting, we should see that these regions are involved before the numbers are fully acquired. So basically to rule out the possibility that the effect we're seeing here is driven just by number words that kids have learned to count to. For each child, we took the highest number they could count to and divided the stimuli into sequences that were within children's counting range and outside of children's counting range. And so what I'm showing you here are regions that were recruited more for the known counting sequences. Um, and so specifically, we see the ventral temporal cortex and also the hippocampus. Um, and this result is consistent with other findings in the literature, um, suggesting that the hippocampus in particular is involved in early mathematical learning. So for example, we see recruitment of the hippocampus in the early stages of arithmetic, so in seven to nine year old children. But then we tend to see less engagement of this region in adolescence and adulthood when problem solving strategies stabilize. <clears throat> 
In contrast, these were the regions that we found were recruited more for unknown number words. So again, we see the intraparietal sulcus is involved in representing unknown number words, but we also see regions of the language network um, are showing greater activation for the unknown count sequences. Um, now, an important disclaimer is that this finding doesn't mean that the IPS isn't representing known counting words, um, but we see that it's especially used for number words that children don't know. And so to test our second prediction that we should see overlap between these regions and numerosity representations, um, we measured numerosity representations in children and adults um, using an explicit numerosity discrimination task in which um, they had to decide whether Cookie Monster or Oscar the Grouch had more cookies. Um, and they did this at either an easy ratio, easy trial with a ratio of 0.25 or a more difficult ratio of 0.6. Um, these are just example trials. So we, of course, um, counterbalanced for things like cumulative surface area and density and which side was correct and all those things. And what we found um, when we compared neural activation for the difficult and easy trials was the kind of traditional numerosity network processing network largely consisting of the intraparietal sulcus and the inferior frontal gyrus. And when we look to see how these regions align with the regions involved in processing the unknown number words, we do see functional overlap between numerosity and number word representations in the intraparietal sulcus. We also see some overlap in the inferior frontal gyrus, um, but that's also where we saw neural representations of alphabet sequences, um, suggesting that this region may play a more um, domain general function, or at the very least, we should have um, additional research that looks into the function of this region. So these data provide support for the cortical recycling hypothesis, um, but they also suggest something more than that. Um, that's not just number numerosity representations that are important for learning to count, um, but they suggest that the evolutionarily primitive numerosity processing um, regions of the brain may interface with the uniquely human language network to ground the verbal acquisition of counting. And with that, I'd like to thank my grad school advisor, Jessica Cantlin, um, the members of our lab and the Imaging Center staff for helping collect the data, and of course our sources of funding, and all of you for being here this morning. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I think we have a long uh, time for one or two questions. Uh, please, uh, you can ask questions through chat box or speak up. I guess maybe we can, uh, people can ask questions at the end of the symposium. Um, Stephanie, uh, feel free to share your screen. Oh. I have to unmute myself. Is that working? Yes, Great. it's working. Okay, so you can see my slides? Okay. Yes. All right, so today I'm going to present um, the first study from my uh, K99 grant that explores the neural basis of number words in young children and adults. Um, and then this the study is conducted in co collaboration with um, Ann Park and Allison Mackey, as well as my supervisor, Elizabeth Brannon. No, there we go. Uh, so learning to count is children's first mathematical experience. Uh, my sound isn't working, but it doesn't really matter. Um, in this picture is my niece, Esme, and she's four. She's practicing our counting. And you can see she's correctly counting five flowers on her card. But if you ask her how many flowers are there, she is unable to give you a, resp a correct response. So she's able to count to five, but she doesn't quite understand that counting to five tells her that there are five things in a set. And although many people in the Zoom call have even demonstrated that number word knowledge is an important foundation for children, the neurobiological correlates that support the development of number word learning is poorly understood. 
So many studies, um, as uh, Alyssa has already reviewed, has demonstrated that adults engage the bilateral regions of the intraparietal sulcus when performing tasks that require semantic processing of number. Um, but there are far fewer studies that are exploring the development of the neural circuitry important for number. So developmental brain imaging studies with infants and young preschool children have that a focus on non-symbolic magnitude processing. Either children passively view a stream of visually presented dot arrays that change in quantity or shape, or children are asked to select the numerically larger quantity, um, an example that I have here. And they found that there is more stable and robust activation, in particular the right IPS. On the other hand, studies with older elementary school age children that perform very similar tasks with numerals instead of dots have shown that the left IPS shows a protracted developmental trajectory that is associated with the acquisition of symbolic number in mathematics. So for example, the representation of numerals um, become more precise with age in the left IPS, but not right IPS. And individual differences in activation during numerical discrimination has been found to be associated with performance on standardized assessments of arithmetic ability. So together, these studies have suggest that across development, the, under, the left IPS might undergo a process of specialization for symbolic numerical processing, and that approximate non-symbolic magnitude processing in the right might support this process. Another developmental trend within the literature is this frontal to parietal shift where children recruit regions in the prefrontal cortex to a greater extent than adults, while, adult, while adults show greater activation in IPS. This might be associated with the lack of numerical fluency in children relative to adults. Um, but the studies that um, I've broadly um, given an overview of have largely focused on either non-symbolic magnitudes and Arabic numerals. And some work from Joanne Lefebvre's group, among others, have shown that children map number words to their quantities before they learn their numerals. So an important gap in the literature is to understand the development of the neural circuitry for mapping number words to their respective quantities earlier in development, including children prior to starting formal school. Uh, so the goals of the study um, were to explore uh, brain regions that are involved in mapping number words to quantities in particular uh, children between the ages of four to 10, as well as adults. We used a novel paradigm, which I will describe next. Therefore, we tested what brain regions were recruited in adults during the number word mapping task and compared those to children and vice versa. So one hypothesis is that children will show greater sort of prefrontal activation relative to adults, while adults might show greater IPS activation relative to children. Second, we tested um, with a broader developmental window, including children prior to school entry, um, specifically within our child sample, whether there were any developmental associations between neural activation and age. And lastly, we tested within our children sample whether um, neural activation during number word mapping was associated with numerical knowledge. And we tested this question in two ways. So we explored whether children's formal schooling experience influenced any correlations between age and neural activation. But we also tested whether neural activation um, was associated with our measures of number knowledge. So to assess number word mapping in young children in the scanner, uh, children conducted a number word matching or mapping task where they simply hear a number word and see a visually presented quantity on the screen. Uh, the behavioral version of the tasks asks children to respond yes if the number word matches the quantity and no if it does not match the quantity. And so children were uh, presented numbers one through four um, and the difference between the mismatched trials um, either differed by a distance of one or two. So if the quantity matches the number word, those are our congruent trials. If the quantity did not match the number word, that those were our incongruent trials. So children performed a passive version of this task in the scanner. And so they were asked to pay very close attention to the number words they hear while they saw the dinosaur eggs presented on the screen. Um, they know some match and they know some do not match because they completed the task outside of the scanner before um, going in. And so the hypothesis here is that brain regions that represent the meaning of number words will show differential activation as a function of congruity. 
So I expected that there would be greater activation for the incongruent trials where the quantity and number does not match relative to congruent trials. So more precise representations of number words will show larger neural congruity effects. So our sample consisted of 22 adults in the, in the Penn community, as well as 80 children. And I included the exclusion criteria here, but I think most importantly, um, we excluded motion if they had greater uh, than one millimeter motion across the scan or if they had greater than 10% um, a volume to volume motion greater than two millimeters. And they also performed um, some behavioral measures outside the scanner. So we collected the numeration subtests from the key math that assesses general number knowledge, as well as the give n task. Um, they also completed the behavioral version of the number word matching that I just described and verbal and nonverbal measures of IQ. So I just want to quickly um, discuss the motion considerations, given that we're scanning very young children. So before the scan, all children completed a mock scan. So they had plenty of time to practice uh, playing still and um, viewing the passive number matching game in the mock scan. We did find that children showed significantly greater motion relative to our adults. So in analyses that included both children and adults, we controlled for motion. We also included motion regressors as well as FSLs extended motion regressors in our single subject GLMs. But we also found no correlations between motion, age, and performance on our behavioral measures. So motion should not be impacted, should not impact our brain behavior correlations. So to first test whether brain regions are engaged in mapping number words to quantities, we first ran a whole brain analysis, testing for a significant difference between the incongruent and congruent trials in adults relative to children. So I found that um, adults should significantly greater activation in the anterior cingulate cortex, so the ACC, and specifically the left intraparietal sulcus. This effect was significantly greater in adults relative to children. However, I found no brain regions that showed significantly greater activity uh, for congruent relative to incongruent trials, and there were no differences in activity as a function of congruity in our children. So contrary to what we expected, children did not show any significant congruity effect in any brain region. And so I just plotted um, on the right here, the perimeter estimates from the ACC and the left IPS that were found in adults. And you can see that there are differences there um, between congruent and incongruent trials in adults, but not in children. So to test whether children showed age-related associations in the neural congruity effect, we used um, a region of interest analysis. So we define regions based on the whole brain analysis with adults. So the left IPS and the ACC are in red, but we also define the bilateral IPS using a conjunction analysis of symbolic and non-symbolic magnitude processing um, published in a meta-analysis by Mariah Sokolowski. Um, and we found significant associations between age and left IPS this is specific right now to the blue region that you see here that was defined based on the meta-analysis. The association between neural congruity and age is stronger in left IPS relative to the right and to ACC. And this association remains significant when we control for both IQ and SES, socioeconomic status. So next I tested whether this association was influenced by whether children attended formal schooling. So we tested for that interaction between the correlation between age and, uh, sorry, age and neural congruity and whether they attend formal school or not. And we found that there was a significant interaction in both of our left IPS clusters. So children who attend formal school show a stronger association between age and neural congruity on left IPS. So my, the children in formal school are in color, um, while the children who don't attend formal school are in black, and the colors are associated with the regions um, on the left-hand side. 
So this association is specific to the left IPS. We did not find an interaction between um, age and neural congruity in the right IPS or in the ACC. Lastly, to examine our hypothesis related to numerical knowledge, we tested the associations between neural congruity effect and our two measures of number knowledge. These are performance on our enumeration subtest from the key math and performance on the behavioral version of our number word mapping task. So regression analysis revealed no relationship between performance on the enumeration subtest and neural congruity in any of our regions of interest. This is while accounting for age. So here I present the two scatter plots for both left IPS regions and numeration raw score on the y-axis. And although we seem to have um, a pattern trending in the hypothesized direction, both raw scores and brain measures are strongly correlated with age. So once we account for age, there is no um, specific association with our numerical or with numer uh, numeration subtest. There's also no associations between performance on our behavioral version of the matching task and neural congruity in any of our regions of interest. And again, I just plot the left IPS clusters here. Um, but just note that a limitation with this task is a lot of the participants performed relatively close to ceiling or at ceiling. So to sum up, we found that adults showed greater neural congruity in left IPS and the anterior cingular cortex relative to children. And contrary to our predictions, children did not exhibit a significant neural congruity effect in any brain region. But instead, we found a strong correlation between neural congruity and left IPS and age that was driven primarily by children who attend formal school, suggesting that the neural integration of number words and their respective quantities emerges later in development with greater exposure to number words in school. Uh, the correlation with age was significantly stronger in left IPS relative to right IPS and ACC, and it remains significant when controlling for IQ and socioeconomic status, which might support previous work that the left IPS shows specialization for processing symbolic representations of number. However, we did not find any significant association between neural congruity and measures of numerical knowledge so one possibility is that we did not have appropriate math measures for the wide age range we include in our sample. So it's unclear from this data whether associations with age are driven by maturation or experience or both. Although the correlations driven by children who attend formal school, which might suggest experience plays a larger role, age in formal school is confounded in our present study. In our Alternative hypothesis or explanation for a data is that um, older children who attend school are better able to um, attend to the task while in the scanner. And although we cannot rule out domain general hypotheses, um, Eric Wilkie's work suggests that it could be a combination of both attentional and numerical processes at play here. So children could become better at attending specifically to the numerical information of the task. Uh, and lastly, an interesting hypothesis for future interventions that focus on strengthening those connections between number words and their respective quantities might elicit adult-like pattern of brain activity sooner in development. And these results, among others, um, for future investigations that focus on understanding these individual differences in developing brain systems might be important for understanding how we can um, optimize learning pathways earlier in development. So that being said, uh, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, funding resources, and the fantastic undergraduate students and participants that um, helped collect this data. And I don't know if there's any questions, but I think I'm a little bit out of time. Yeah, thanks for interesting data. I really like the part uh, there is a differences but between the children who attend uh, formal school and who not. Um, uh, I think we have uh, uh, time for just one question uh, while John is switch, uh, sharing his slide. Oh, it's hard to see the chat when you're presenting. Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. I understand. Uh, no questions, maybe at the end of the symposium. Yeah, uh, I think John is ready. Um, How does that look for everyone? Look good. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Um, and if there's no questions from the previous talk, I'll, I'll get started. Okay. Uh, wait a second. Uh, there is uh, one question. Okay. Uh, uh, the, given the children had a very high accuracy on the task already, what do you think the correlation with age reflects? It's uh, for Stephanie. That's interesting. Um, so I think that the accuracy on the task is a good indicator that children at least understand their number words, but the accuracy was collected outside of the scanner. Uh, while they were in the scanner, they passively viewed those quantities. Uh, so it's, I think, independent of performance. Um, and I have sort of, the way in which I interpret the correlation with age is either um, might be associated with becoming uh, so sort of greater number word representations or more precise representations. So they're integrating the number words with their quantity is more precisely. But an alternate possibility is that it could reflect um, domain general resources like executive functioning or inhibitory control, which unfortunately I didn't um, assess in this current study and future work should probably address that. Great, uh, John, uh, I think John can start. Okay, um, let's see. All right, everybody can see me? Yes. Excellent, okay. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be sharing some data that we have about the no representations of symbolic and non-symbolic uh, fraction processing in adolescents. And so for the past several years, our research group has been studying questions about how people come to understand the meaning of fractions. And in this latest investigation, we examine these questions among adolescent participants, specifically eighth graders, which are individuals between the ages of 13 and 14. And today I'd like to present how this data actually builds upon our previous investigations using the same task we used with the eighth graders. Um, so I'll be showing the data from our adult participants and also our second and fifth graders to kind of give a sort of a cross-sectional developmental view of what we've been finding. And so first, before I can address the question of how to ask adolescents access and meaning of fractions, I should first uh, address how fractions can mean many things. For instance, the symbolic fraction one half can represent a specific rational number of magnitude directly in between zero and one. Um, it could represent a ratio where one thing is half of the size of something or it could be talking about a part of a whole. Um, and this is just uh, some of the meanings that fractions have, but today I'd like to focus on magnitude. And uh, I'd like to focus on magnitude because it's, it's a, an abstract concept that we could say that both symbolic fractions and non-symbolic ratios all kind of convey magnitude in some sort of way. And the fascinating question then is, how does our mind represent magnitude when we're viewing whether it's symbolic fractions or non-symbolic ratios. Are there ways in which this processing is shared? Um, are there ways that the understanding of fractions builds on non-symbolic ratios? These are all interesting questions that we can address in multiple different ways. Uh, but it, today what I'd like to do is just present our neural data to kind of talk about what that insight can provide us for these kinds of questions. So um, previous studies have uh, looked at these kind of neural representations meaning the location where we see magnitude sensitivity in the brain when people are looking at either non-symbolic uh, ratios, such as these dot arrays uh, presenting a ratio of black to white dots, or line ratios presenting the length of one line to one another, or more symbolic or verbal representations. Um, and across these studies, uh, a certain uh, number of regions have been popping up and collectively we can call them a frontal parietal network which would be regions in the uh, frontal cortex and the parietal cortex. And specifically this uh, superior parietal lobule uh, sorts of regions along the intraparietal sulcus. And so uh, we come into our studies knowing that these regions are regions that have been repeatedly uh, found as important for in some way kind of um, carrying some of the magnitude information about how we understand these things. Um, but uh, what hasn't been done is really looking developmentally at these um, kinds of representations of the brain and how uh, experience and education impacts these sorts of things, 
and also looking within the same individuals within the same task, do these sorts of regions overlap? So to sort of fill this gap of understanding the development of uh, neural representations of fraction and ratios, we create a cross-format magnitude comparison task. Individuals lay down in the MRI scanner, uh, where we then present them with magnitude comparisons, where they have to choose the larger of two stimuli. And specifically, we've got three different conditions, a symbolic fraction-fraction comparison, a non-symbolic uh, line ratio comparison, and a cross-format, uh, where one of the stimuli is a line ratio and the other one is a small fraction. So again, we're asking to choose the larger the magnitude in these three formats, and we randomize and intermix them so people don't know what uh, they're going to see next, and ask people to be as fast and as accurate as possible. And the way that we kind of are able to then to understand uh, how magnitude and judgments of magnitude play into the neural and the behavioral effects, uh, we vary the numeric distance between our pairs. And so we had pairs uh, as, as far apart as one-sixth and six-sevenths, or we had pairs that were, were close together in magnitude, near distance pairs, such as two sevenths and one third. And so then uh, using this paradigm, what we were able to do is we were able to ask, can we observe common brain regions that are sensitive to the magnitudes of symbolic fractions and non-symbolic ratios? Um, and specifically what we did here, we looked uh, at the neural activity. Um, we modeled the neural activity when people are making these neural comparisons, medium and far comparisons. And we specifically looked at the near and far kind of comparisons. There were about uh, um, a number of them in each of these kind of distance bins. And then uh, we looked for, in a whole brain contrast, significant regions of the brain uh, showing where activity was greater for near comparisons relative to far. And we'll be calling these sorts of effects neural distance effects. And we'll be looking uh, for regions in the frontal and the parietal lobe. Uh, for these sorts of distance effects and specifically along our intraparietal sulcus um, where we had seen those um, effects before in previous studies. And so with our adults, um, I'll first present this data. Uh, we've got our, our error rates and response times if you're curious about those up there, but I'm going to focus on the neural effects. If we then look for where neural distance effects appeared for our non-symbolic line ratio comparisons, our symbolic fraction-fraction comparisons in blue, and our uh, cross-format comparisons in uh, this magenta color, what we observe is that um, we kind of replicate the findings that we've seen in previous studies, where regions in the um, uh, parietal cortex, oh, and to kind of let you know how to look at this figure, here's the back of the brain, the right and the left hemisphere, and this would be an individual looking away from you into the right. And so um, in the in bilateral IPS, as well as these kind of frontal regions, we're seeing uh, locations that are sensitive to our uh, manipulation of numeric distance um, and also sensitive in, in all of the different formats that we present them in. So this provides us with a bit more information about um, kind of how the brain represents magnitude or represents magnitude when making these comparison judgments, consistent with what we had seen in previous studies. Um, but what we're also interested in is how do these systems develop? How, do, how does the brain specialize to be sensitive to magnitudes? And so, um, uh, as some of you may know, our lab is doing a longitudinal study where we're following second graders and fifth graders over the course of years. Um, and so what I'll be showing today is the first year of this longitudinal study where we've got this cross-sectional sample of second graders and fifth graders, which are, it's an interesting kind of split in terms of age because with second graders, what we have are individuals who have never had any formal fractions instruction, and fifth graders who have uh, had a little bit of fractions instruction. In the US, uh, third grade is the time when uh, we introduce these sorts of things. Um, and so we were interested in kind of two main sorts of theories and hypotheses when it came to the study. One, do we see neural distance effects prior to formal fractions instruction, uh, and where might we see them? And what is the effect of formal fractions instruction on these neural distance effects? And one reason why we might expect to see, especially among the non-symbolic comparisons, uh, neural distance effects in the second graders who haven't had any formal instruction in fractions or ratios is that previous uh, researchers, including in our research group, have proposed that uh, these early kind of perceptual experiences that we have viewing things in real life and understanding the proportions that we see and making decisions with these proportions 
are creating kind of a foundation of our understanding of ratios and proportions, even if we're not thinking about it in a sort of academic or formal mathematics sense. Um, and that these sort of perceptual systems that allow us to see these magnitudes um, are then uh, allowing us to uh, kind of uh, see magnitude in different ways. And so what we do observe in our second graders and fifth graders um, is this sort of uh, where we don't observe any kind of neural distance effect significantly in the second graders when they're performing this symbolic fraction to fraction comparison. Um, but we do see uh, distance effects in the right IPS, uh, a little bit in the left and the frontal regions of the brain when it comes to these non-symbolic magnitude comparisons. Um, and we provided a little bit of instruction uh, to the second graders so they could at least have a chance to complete uh, the fraction fraction comparisons even though they hadn't had formal instruction. Um, but even with that, we're not seeing these kind of uh, regions of sensitivity. But the fifth graders, they're looking a lot more like adults. We're seeing these regions in bilateral IPS as well as the frontal regions of the brain um, where we're seeing this kind of overlap in neural distance effects that cuts across the different formats. Um, suggesting that at this age, after a little bit of formal fractions instruction, they're able to think about the magnitudes a bit more deeply and also may have started to develop uh, systems to understand these magnitudes. So we have this kind of developmental picture and uh, what I said I was gonna be talking about today is the eighth graders and so that's what we have today. Uh, the reason I kind of focused a bit more on the other uh, studies is that with our eighth graders, we had to stop due to COVID. So we're a little bit underpowered in these analyses, but it, it was kind of an interesting uh, effect to see. What we affected was something that was kind of in between fifth graders and adults. Um, but we actually found uh, a fairly unique pattern where we saw more lateralization in our effects. We saw that non-symbolic comparisons in these eighth graders were showing more significant distance effects in the frontal and the parietal regions of the brain in the right hemisphere. Whereas for fractions, which we could think of as maybe a more uh, verbal stimuli, something that uh, people can think of uh, with, with maybe without uh, considering kind of more like uh, spatial representations of them, we're seeing the fraction distance effects in the left hemisphere. And granted, we had less participants, so we've, we've looked at this with a, a more liberal threshold, and it does seem like <clears throat> perhaps we might see some distance effects in the right hemisphere with the symbolic fractions, but we'll wait for our data to come in once we can start a study again to see if that's true. And so it's interesting to see these preliminary results. They could um, indicate some sort of uh, understanding of fractions and ratios that's in a way kind of estranged or separate in this eight age range when eighth graders aren't necessarily focusing on fractions as a specific topic in their math classes, but rather maybe thinking about how to automatize that information so they can learn other higher order math skills. <clears throat> And so they might be accessing these in unique ways. And it's interesting to think about how manipulations of the task might actually lead to these results, such as maybe uh, instructions or kind of um, training that could have people think about fractions more in a spatial sort of sense and to see if that moves these things around. And that's an interesting question we'd like to look for in the future. And indeed these contrasts present preliminary findings, findings that we wanna analyze further and build upon in future research and specifically looking at these sorts of effects in more kind of nuanced ways, whether that be the, the pattern of activation we see as opposed to just these distance effects, or looking in these sorts of uh, training study sorts of things to see how uh, these experiences, learning about fractions and ratios, whether these learning experiences try to link an understanding across these modalities, lead to different neural representations, or even among our longitudinal sample, we're curious to see how that data will come out and if it will actually map on to these sorts of cross-sectional findings that we find here today. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank my uh, uh, advisors, uh, former advisors, as well as um, Yunji, who did a lot of the work with the child, children data, and Priya Karla, our, our uh, postdoc, who also did a lot of work with the children data as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, since we have a time limit, um, the time constraint, so uh, while I'm sharing screen, maybe uh, there is some um, questions, please feel free to ask. <clears throat>
Mm, I guess not. We have one question actually. Uh, okay. Mushtaba. Mushtaba, mm -hmm. do you want to maybe ask that out aloud? Mm -hmm. um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thanks for the very nice presentation. Um, comparing the, to the second graders, fifth graders show a more extended um, activation in different uh, regions. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether we can conclude that learning a new skill, which here was fraction, understanding of fraction, led to increased activation in um, different brain regions as compared to second graders? Yeah, I guess I, I interpret that in the, the other direction that with second graders who on the spot were introduced with a, a short little PowerPoint, what fractions are, um, and they're kind of learning these sorts of things that um, these second graders might have had more diversity in how they were coming about and thinking about these sorts of things, leading to less uh, significant effects. Because if, if the uh, location of the distance effects if there were happening within individuals in second grade, wouldn't show up on this global kind of group level. Um, and I, I think that perhaps it could be that uh, the fifth graders who, um, assuming that they've gone through similar educational processes might be developing similar systems and relying on similar systems for their understanding and therefore might be showing these kind of greater effects. But that's just one interpretation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, since we have a 10 minutes left, so I'll start my presentation. Hi, uh, I'm going to, uh, in this talk, I'm going, to, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about structural connectivity, how it relates to symbolic and non-symbolic fractions in second and fifth graders. Oops. So uh, we all know that number knowledge is important for future mathematics. So far, previous studies have largely investigated with how we learn whole number knowledge and its operations, especially. And however, uh, recently fractions knowledge has been emphasized for mastering complex and advanced mathematics such as algebra, which provides a pathway to fractions um, higher educations. So with recent emphasis on fractions knowledge, our team has proposed that there is a ratio processing system in our brain dedicated to processing non-symbolic ratio like line ratios that John introduced. And quite a number of studies have found that humans and even non-humans like monkeys and parrots can process, uh, can discriminate these uh, non-symbolic ratios. And this theory further hypothesized that RPS may serve as a, primi a primitive neurocognitive foundation for uh, learning fractions knowledge. So a few neuroimaging studies also uh, reported the shared brain regions uh, between non-symbolic ratio and symbolic fraction processing as John introduced previously, uh, specifically in the provider and prefrontal cortex, and especially the intraprovider circus has been uh, repeatedly suggested as a primary region where we're presenting any quantity information, uh, for example, um, including fractions, ratio magnitude, and whole number, and numerosities. However, about this fractions processing, unlike studies with uh, other uh, with a whole number, uh, we don't know much about how the microstructure underneath, such as the tracks connecting these regions, um, are related with non-symbolic and symbolic fractions processing. So uh, we had uh, two questions. The first one uh, was, how does the microstructure relate to non-symbolic ratio and symbolic fraction processing ability? And we expected uh, ratio and fra uh, fraction processing ability might relate to a white matter track um, underneath from the provider region of the brain as fMRI study showed. Uh, and second question was, how's the relation be uh, change before and after fraction instructions? For example, second grader haven't got, um, haven't received any fraction instructions, so they might not show uh, any relation with the fraction processing, but may show like relation with the non-symbolic ratio processing. So to answer this question, uh, we employed the diffusion tensor imaging, and DTI is the one of the techniques that detects how water molecules in the white matter diffuse. So white matter is filled with myelinated axon like this, uh, especially this part. Uh, 
uh, and that bundle of axons are called tracks, and these axons connect different brain regions. For example, uh, provider uh, linking provider and frontal and interhemisphere. Uh, I should uh, I should make this. Um, oh, I can uh, show a video. Anyhow, uh, so interhemisphere uh, and then occipitotemporal areas. And depending on the structure of the brain, uh, structure of the tracks, uh, for example, water molecules move faster along the tracks uh, or move slower uh, where uh, tracks hinders their movements. And uh, by looking at this diffusion, we can guess how water white matter uh, looks like. And DTI can compute how well the tracks connect different brain regions we call structural structural connectivity. And let's assume that we have a several neurons here, uh, even though I just have one. Um, DTI can represent structural connectivity uh, with the measure called fractional anisotropy. And moreover, we can look uh, at other aspects of white matter uh, tracks uh, with other measures, other type of measures, such as measure relate to how well axons are how well axons are myelinated, and measures uh, that relates to how well axons are propagated. So um, we this technique we answer uh, to answer to our earlier question. We collected second graders and fifth graders, and second grader who haven't received any fraction instructions, and fifth grader who haven't received um, a few years of fraction instructions. And we measure children's non-symbolic and symbolic fraction processing ability with a cross-notation comparison task John introduced. Um, so children performed that task in the scanner during fMRI scan of the DTI. As a reminder, participants' job was to uh, choose which ratio or fraction is numerically, is numerically larger. So we presented three different notation conditions, a symbolic comparing frac frac, a fraction fractions and cross notation comparing line ratio and fractions and non-symbolic notation comparing to line ratios. And we used accuracy and RT in each notations as a proxy for non-symbolic uh, ratio and symbolic fraction processing abilities. And um, we since uh, this uh, task is a computerized task. We also measure children's processing speed as a covariance. And we found uh, behavioral differences between second and fifth graders. The graph describes uh, the mean accuracy of the second and uh, fifth graders um, in each notation. And FF is a frac frac line, of, uh, LF is a cross notation, and LL is um, non symbol notations. And fifth grader showed a higher um, accuracy in all notations, and non symbolic comparison was the most accurate, and fraction comparison was the least accurate. And we observed the same result in RT. Fifth graders were faster um, in all notations, and non symbolic comparison was the fastest, and symbolic comparison was uh, slowest. And there was a neural difference. We found fifth grader showed higher connectivity. FA, uh, fraction and isotropy, and the picture depicts uh, the region showed um, higher FA in fifth grader, the red part. And the difference has been shown in temporal part of the brain uh, in the most of white matter in, uh, in parietal and temporal part of the brain. And the part of the tracks link uh, these regions included the part of tracks linking front of parietal and parietal um, uh, occipital temporal and also interhemisphere. And when it comes to the relation with uh, white matter tracks and ratio and uh, fraction processing abilities, we only found uh, significant correlations in fifth grader, uh, but not in second grader. So any of measures were not related in um, with uh, second graders white matter. And first of all, uh, fraction and isotropy value, uh, white matter connectivity, was uh, correlated only with symbolic fraction uh, comparison abilities. So the signif uh, significant region um, was very localized with where red color is, is uh, a very localized span uh, bilateral cesium stratum here and including and this area includes uh, the tracks linking 
uh, frontal occipital and uh, occipital temporal. So especially the inferior uh, long string of cicalus is uh, the tracks linking occipital temporal and uh, I'm going to discuss um, in the discussion. So uh, this will be the only tracks that I will say full name. And the symbolic uh, fraction processing ability was also correlated with other measures of GTI. So the measure relates to the myelinations of axons. So this time, the significant uh, region covered broad areas uh, spanning front of parietal, parietal temporal, and um, uh, occipital temporal. And also the tracks linking um, top to bottom. And the results were bit right lateralized. And on the other hand, um, there is a, uh, I found a correlation with nosmal ratio and white matter too, but the measure relates to uh, axonal propagations um, of white matter was correlated with only with nosmal ratio compared uh, ratio processing ability, and mostly in the left hemisphere. Um, so which contrary to, uh, which a bit contrary to the results of MD and RD. And this region covered um, the frontal parietal area, the tracks linking frontal parietal and tracks linking occipital temporal areas. So if we go back to earlier question, we did find the relation, differential relationship between white matter and non-symbolic ratio and symbolic fraction processing abilities uh, with symbolic fractions of a left area with a, a localized region under temporal cortex and especially the tracks linking occipital temporal, the ILF, um, was found, and this track, this inferior lung fasciculus, is frequently reported as a track related with uh, visual representation or language ability. So this may imply the importance of uh, visual and verbal representations to process symbolic fractions. And so far, no fMRI studies with fraction have reported the engagements of uh, temporal lobe. So maybe further study can look at uh, take a look more. And we also find a different, uh, different um, relations on different white matter characteristics in the patients. The degree of myelinations um, was more related to um, symbolic fractions and the degree of axon propagations was more related to non-symbolic ratios in the patients. So also we found a bit lateralized, uh, a, a bit different lateralizations in the research with um, the different measures of um, DTI, a different white matter characteristics. So far, there is no coherent uh, picture about lateralizations. So it may be just simply indicates uh, a less developed numerical processing in early years or a less developed interhemisphere uh, connections. Oops. And about, uh, and for second questions, uh, the difference may be simply uh, because of the amount of time the student exposed to fraction concept to the extent that white matter um, reflects uh, their individual differences uh, when it comes to their um, uh, fraction and ratio processing. It would be interesting to look at how the relation changes between second and fifth um, grade years long studently, um, and that data will coming up soon. So uh, I'm a bit out of time, I guess. Uh, and I thank you for our uh, co-authors and the uh, funding sources and all the children who participated in our study. And if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, we are a bit out of time, but um, I know. Uh, so, oh, yeah, there is a question. Uh, I wonder whether we can conclude that learning fraction in fifth grader led to increased brain activations. Oh, I guess this question is for John. I believe that was the question. That, uh, that, that question, yeah, okay. Yeah, I got confused um, in the chat and the real one. And I know I, I can stick around for a little extra time if. Um, yeah. Um, if okay, individual different. Oh, there is a question uh, from Nina. 
look at individual differences and maybe correlations uh, with the methods. We haven't looked at it yet, but um, we have a fraction knowledge measure. So uh, yeah, uh, I think I'm planning to look at it. But uh, with the math achievements, um, there are a lot of studies who have um, the study have shown that uh, there is um, relations between Y matters and um, the math achievements um, and even numerosity processing. And also there is um, a question to, uh, from Parnica. Do you think individual differences in visual spatial ability could account for some activations when performing non-symbolic ratio task? Uh, I think this question is for John. Yeah, when I think about um, the non-symbolic ratio comparison, I, I do think it, of it within sort of kind of these visual spatial skills. Um, and um, it would be very interesting to see um, how a separate measure of that might correlate, whether that be to just response times or accuracy, as well as uh, the neural effect too. Um, I do think that we have some of those kind of covariates within the um, children data, which I haven't been working as closely to, but um, that's certainly something that I'm, I'm sure it, it, it's on somebody's mind to look at it and I would be curious to see what that looks like too. Um, but I, I would assume that uh, people's ability to think about things spatially um, would in ways uh, matter, but also uh, people are very good at the non-symbolic comparisons, even from a young age. And so this might be something that is fairly automatic and fairly um, accurate. Um, and so you might not see a lot of correlations just because people are doing so good. Uh, it might have a little bit of a ceiling effect with that. Great. Um, there is a question for Elisa. Uh, what do you think is the function of the left IFG in your study? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, the prefrontal cortex is tricky, but also I think really interesting because there are so many different things that could be going on. Um, and in the tasks that I presented, I don't think we quite have specificity to really narrow in on everything. So it could be numerosity processing related. It could be language related. Um, there are a lot of executive functions involved in those regions of the brain. So it could be a whole bunch of things. And I guess I'm pretty open to any of those things being possible. Great. Um, do we have other question or um, is there any person who want to speak up? Guess not. I guess not. <laughs> Okay, then um, thank you everyone for attending. Yeah. Uh, Ninja, do you have some final words? Sorry. Uh, no, uh, just thanks for everyone uh, being, a guest, uh, being a speaker and uh, thanks for everyone coming to our symposium. And um, I hope there is a time that we can talk about uh, in person, uh, talk about this matter in person. Thank you, everyone. So next week, we have the symposium Early Interventions, Finger Counting, Patterning, Working Memory, and Number Games, organized by Rebecca Bo. Uh, and so I see you all next Thursday. Thank you. Bye. Bye.